Anyone who's heard anything about aviation disasters has probably heard of aircrafts losing an engine or wing flap mid-flight. But what happens when an aircraft loses its roof 11,000 feet in the sky after an explosion? This was the incredible conundrum faced on the 28th of April 1988 by Aloha Airlines Flight 243, operated using a Boeing 737-200. So, how did this brief flight within Hawaii, from Hilo to Honolulu, end up with passengers literally having no roof over their heads? Let's delve into it. The events of April 28, 1988, will forever remain etched in aviation history for presenting some of the most harrowing images of an aircraft carrying passengers. You've probably seen the image online, and no, it's not photoshopped. On that fateful day, 90 passengers boarded Aloha Airlines Flight 243, headed to Honolulu International Airport from the Hilo International Airport. It was a brief flight expected to last no longer than an hour or so. The aircraft used for the flight was a Boeing 737297, later named King Kalaniopu after a former supreme monarch of the island of Hawaii. It was constructed in 1969 and delivered to Aloha as a new aircraft. Before the accident, it had accumulated around 35,496 flight hours, spread over 86,680 flight cycles. The reason for so many flight cycles was the aircraft's use on short flights to and between Hawaii's islands. However, little did they know that so many flight cycles would come back to haunt them. Joining the 90 passengers on board were 44-year-old Captain Robert Schornsteimer, with 8,500 flight hours on his books, of which 6,700 were in Boeing 737s. And 36-year-old First Officer Madeline Mimi Tompkins, the first female pilot in Aloha Airlines history, with 3,500 of her total 8,000 flight hours in the Boeing 737. They were also joined on board by an FAA air traffic controller, and all five crew members were vastly experienced in handling all the necessary stuff for the aircraft. Nothing unusual was spotted during the pre-flight inspection by the first officer on the 737 aircraft, which had already completed three round trips that day. So, at 1.25 p.m. local time that day, Flight 243 departed with 95 souls on board for the short trip to the capital. A journey it would never complete that day. The takeoff and ascent of the aircraft were smooth and it reached its normal flight altitude of 24,000 feet without any incident. However, just 20 minutes into the flight, with the aircraft now around 23 nautical miles southeast of Kahului, something shocking happened. A section of the left side of the roof of the aircraft ruptured, sending out a loud whooshing sound. This explosive decompression caused the aircraft to begin to yaw in both directions as controls went loose. What has just happened? Well, in a split second, an 18 feet long section of the roof got torn off, extending from just behind the cockpit to the forewing area. Captain Robert could almost stare directly at the blue sky. First Officer Madeline noticed pieces of grey insulation floating in the cockpit as well as the fact that the cockpit door had broken away. It all had happened so suddenly and so fast that 58-year-old flight attendant Clarabelle Lansing got sucked out of the plane as she wasn't fastened to any seats like others on board. Passengers on board were terrified and screams began to ring around the aircraft as everyone looked for something to hold on to. Some passengers began to say their final prayers as deployed oxygen masks failed to work. Some passengers were struck unconscious by the flying debris, suffering serious concussions and lacerations to boot. The rest of the crew members, including the FAA guy on board, quickly put on their oxygen masks as the captain initiated an emergency diversion descent to the Maui Kahului Airport by extending the speed brakes. However, the whooshing sounds were so loud that communication between the cockpit crew was almost impossible, so they had to resort to using hand signals. The first officer attempted to notify the Honolulu Air Route Traffic Control Center about what had just happened and the diversion plans. However, due to the ambient noise, communication between the aircraft and the control center was proving to be almost impossible, as you can imagine. Fortunately, a controller did pick up an earlier signal sent via a transponder, 
but was still unable to communicate with the aircraft. The captain, therefore, descended the 737 to an altitude of 14,000 feet. The first officer switched the radio to the frequency of the Maui control tower in a bid to inform them of their approach as well as the dire situation of the aircraft. She also tried to declare an emergency, this time at around 11,000 feet, but once again, the ambient noise made communication difficult. Thankfully, however, she was able to get some important messages through and informed the local controller that they needed assistance. The respondent then called for an ambulance and requested the number of people aboard the aircraft. At this point, the first officer was unaware of what happened earlier, with Clarabel being sucked out of the plane, so she gave the complete figure. Captain Robert descended towards 10,000 feet. He began to slow the aircraft by retracting the speed brake. He had taken his oxygen mask off as there was less pressure at this altitude as he gradually turned the aircraft towards the Maui Kahului Airport runway. With the aircraft now moving at 210 knots, communication between the pilots was now possible. The captain, in trying to get the aircraft to descend, aimed to get the wing flaps under control. But in his attempt to extend beyond flap 5, the aircraft became less controllable, so he decided to reverse the decision. However, he also realized that he couldn't control the aircraft below 170 knots either. This meant that his only option was to maintain a speed above that threshold. So he commanded First Officer Madeline to lower the landing gear to the normal point in the approach pattern. This seemed to work, but something unexpected happened. The main gear indicated down and locked, but the nose gear position indicator light stayed off, so the pilots tried to lower the landing gear manually, but the light remained off. They immediately relayed this information to the control tower and the captain decided to instead advance the throttle. However, in doing so, the captain began to sense a strong yawing motion of the aircraft, which usually means that an engine had failed, and with the direction of the yawing, it looked to be the left engine which had failed. So the captain tried to restart the engine by placing the start switch to the flight position, but there was no response. As the aircraft approached the runway at Maui Kahului, the control tower informed the crew of their downward-facing nose gear. At such proximity, a downward-facing nose gear posed a huge threat. You see, as an aircraft touches down, the misaligned gear could lead to a jarring impact, rattling the entire plane, which can cause significant damage to the jet or even worse. To put it simply, a downward-facing nose gear meant trouble. But nevertheless, they were somehow able to complete a successful emergency landing just 13 minutes after a third of the roof had come off. Apart from Clarabel, who got sucked out of the 737 when the roof tore off, everyone else on board somehow managed to remain in the aircraft. Upon landing, evacuation teams were deployed to get all passengers out of the aircraft. The scenes from the runway were nothing short of horrifying. 65 passengers were reported to be injured, with eight of them sustaining serious injuries. With insufficient medical equipment available for such an emergency, the evacuation process for the injured had to be improvised and was aided by tour vans from Akamai Tours. Nevertheless, Flight 243 was nothing short of a miracle. The unfortunate loss of Clarabel was devastating, but it could have been a lot worse. Now, with the passengers and the aircrew being safe, one big question remains. How did the roof get torn off in the first place? Well, following this incident, the 737 aircraft was investigated by the NTSB to find the answers as to why the roof would come off in such a manner. When they realized why, it terrified them. You see, it was noted that the 737-200 was designed to have, on average, a 20-year service life and around 75,000 flight cycles as pressurization gradually weakened the aircraft's fuselage over time. Now, if you paid attention in the beginning of this video, you know that this was not the case for the 737 that was used for Flight 243. In fact, the aircraft had accumulated 89,680 flight cycles. That is almost 15,000 flight cycles too much. So, how did this happen? Well, you see, it's because of the 737's history of making those short hops to and across Hawaii. Even though the aircraft had only been in service for 19 years. And that's not all. 
because there was another lead that revealed something terrifying, and for that, we need to look at the 737 production line. You see, in the production line where the 737-200 was produced, cold bonding had been utilized with adhesives used to maintain surface contacts in the joints, thus allowing for the transfer of load within. Basically, cold bonding was used to save cost and reduce overall weight, but the methods used to apply and the storage conditions of the adhesives were not ideal for the humid, salty-aired Hawaiian climate as they made the joints more susceptible to corrosion. These were probably the major catalysts for the metal fatigue, which the aircraft ultimately paid the price for. Also, rather than grounding their aircraft for complete body examinations, Aloha instead conducted occasional checks under the most lax and uncoordinated conditions, including at nights under artificial light. This was probably how the cracks responsible for the ejection of the roof failed to be detected. Final investigations by the NTSB concluded that the accident was a result of metal fatigue, which was further aggravated by fissure corrosion along the fuselage. They noted that the 737 was designed with tear straps every 10 inches of the fuselage, which meant that any tear in the fuselage would be constrained to a 10 square inch area. This should, in theory and practice, prevent an explosive decompression. However, on this particular aircraft, the cracks in the fuselage were so many that they easily connected and ran right through the tear straps. Further examinations confirmed that the primary damage was caused by the complete separation of the upper crown skin from other fuselage structures. As the roof section was never recovered, it was difficult to come to a conclusion as to what exactly happened the moment it got separated from the rest of the fuselage. But in summary, Aloha Airlines failure to properly manage its maintenance processes ultimately led to the horrific event that cost the life of 58-year-old Clarabelle Lansing. And although Aloha Airlines accepted some responsibility for the incident, they never should have allowed such nonchalance in the first place. The FAA also retains a share of the blame for failing to properly evaluate Aloha's maintenance programs and assessing their quality control deficiencies. The body of Clarabelle Lansing was sadly never found, but a memorial garden was opened in her name at the Honolulu International Airport in 1995. The events and scenes from Flight 243 were so shocking and significant that they have been portrayed in multiple documentaries and TV series since. They've also influenced a number of aviation safety policies and procedures in the following years. So what do you think about the horrific events of Aloha Airlines Flight 243? Who do you think deserved the most blame? Please share your thoughts in the comments below.